Hello, everybody. My name is Emily Springer. I'm an academic trainer in the Center for Teaching and Learning, and I'm grateful to see so many people joining us today for our webinar. We're so thrilled to have one of our very own NCU alumni coming back to present in our webinar series, Dr. Jackie Hood-Martin. Thank you so much for being here today. And um, today she will be presenting in partnership with VESC and the CTL. Her webinar is focused on excellence in education, collaboration, and technology. A couple of housekeeping things as we move forward. Just remember that this is being recorded and we will post it in our CTL webinars LibGuide page for future reference. We absolutely want this to be an interactive session. So as Dr. Jackie decides to pause and ask and see if there's any questions or any conversation in the chat, please don't hesitate to participate there. A couple of other things. We do have a live transcript of this webinar. So in case you want to see that as well, all you'll need to do is hit your CC option at the bottom of your Zoom and hit show subtitle. Without any further ado, um, one piece of information, I'm so sorry, let me backtrack. I wanted to point out that Dr. Jackie is actually starting a new show, which I hope she actually talks about a little <laughs> bit more, called A Balanced Life with Dr. Jackie, and it's on the Black Star Network platform. So it's a streaming service. And I had to mention that before I pass this over to our very own director of VASC, Dr. Amy Lynn, so she can say a few words about our VASC um, Center at NCU. Thank you. Thanks so much, Emily. Hi, I'm Dr. Amy Lynn. I am so thrilled to be here with Dr. Jackie, who I've had the pleasure of also interviewing on the VESC podcast. And if you missed that, please check it out. She's also written a blog for VESC called Recalibrating. But beyond those things, we've had some other meetings between the two of us, and she is just fabulous. I really think you're going to enjoy her company tonight and learn a lot from her presentation. And I'm just so thrilled that Vest can continue to bring these webinars um, out into our community. And that is all. Ha enjoy your webinar tonight. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope that you are doing well. I am delighted tonight to be on this platform and sharing this space with each of you. It gives us an opportunity to sit back and look at education and check in with each other and see how we're doing in this pandemic, whether you are a current student, if you have little ones at home, if you're just really trying to figure out how to get through, this is the time that we have together tonight to just really talk about what it looks like to be an educator, to be a learner, how we across generations are sharing this space together. I will say that it's not easy consistently being in the little chiclet box, as I've been calling it lately, um, that we're constantly here on Zoom and finding ourselves in other technology-based platforms that, you know, in some ways it allows us to have more connectivity than we had when we were able to get out and about. But because some of us are now out and about, we have an opportunity to also see each other face to face. So tonight in our time together, I would like to spend that time to talk about how do we in a cross-generational society collaborate and connect with each other and use the platforms that are available, but then also find that lane, that fine line between being able to just really garner insight and wisdom from people from different generations. We all learn differently. We all perceive and receive information in different quantities at different times. So this gives us the opportunity to do so. So I'm gonna I'm load gonna up my platform, my um, PowerPoint now. I'm, I'm, I'm meeting my PM. If each of you would like to say in the chat where you're from, that'll get us started for just a few moments. Um, so where is everyone across this vast area in which we are all occupying? I am here in Loudoun County in Leesburg, Virginia. And some of you, let me see where you're from. I can check that I, out in I the I can chat. see there are some from Boston, Colorado, South Carolina. Texas, Georgia, Virginia, South Korea, San Francisco, all over, really. 
I love that. And, in, and I love that we can have this dialogue together on this platform, because as we know, there are so many different learning styles. There's so many different ways that school districts and systems and institutions, even from a professional level, allow us to create space to learn. And so tonight, as I'm talking and something piques your interest, so you have a comment, please do not hesitate to place it in the chat, because we are here in this space to grow together, to learn from one another, and just understand and value how collaboration works in this cross-generational space called technology. So here we go. Our objective for this afternoon is to provide us in this learning community with the insights that we can share from each other in the role in the way that all of our varied backgrounds and the way that we utilize technology in our various age groups, because that is a thing nowadays, our age groups, to see how technology really has broadened our landscape. I can definitely recall at a time when people were like, we're going to use what and how do you get to the World Wide Web and technology and how do we go from three quarter disk to floppy disk to using thumb drives to now putting things in a cloud. Technology has definitely changed the way we consume information and how we connect with one another. So in hindsight, if you'll put these kind of questions in the chat, who was your favorite teacher and why? That'll be our first question tonight. We all have this one teacher that sticks out in our minds that either caused us to want to be in education, really made us hate going to class every day. And then there are some teachers who just really said, you know, you can get through this and this is why I became a teacher. So who was your favorite teacher and why? And we'll wait just a moment while people can pop that in the chat. I'm gonna go ahead and share. One of my favorite okay. teachers sure. was a dance teacher um, in uh, freshman year of college because she challenged me in ways I've never been challenged before. Very nice. She challenged you in ways you've never been challenged before anyone else. So if nothing related to this question, we have some. Okay. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh yes. yes. All right, here we go. <laughs> yes. I had to think about it. I know it's been a while. <laughs> I know it's, it's been taking a while. them time to, time to type their stories. <laughs> yes. yes, absolutely. Yes. Well, I can't wait to hear and read them. So we have um, some are Margie Smith because she taught me to love science and fall in love with learning. Um, a band director, Mr. Galvez, Mrs. Ross, she took the time to ensure I understood the subject and not just pass me. <laughs> I love that. I can appreciate that one. <laughs> I like that a lot. A couple more that I'm seeing in here. I just got to expand my chat so I can share sure. it. Um, we have an English teacher back home. She challenged me to learn more about a language. College instructor, the, Mr. Davis, very, very learner-centered beyond the music content. Miss Levine, because she always believed in me. Striking to see that people remember the names. Yes, that means that person had a wonderful impact on your life. And that's what we seek in education. What is the impact that has been made? And what is the impact that we're making today? Another question is, what would you tell your early learner self? And um, I'll, I'll start with this one. My early learner self, um, pay attention more in class. Um, <laughs> there are days when teachers would start talking and I'm a daydreamer and I catch myself still today. I have to be cautious about just wandering off into the butterfly zone, you know, when teachers are talking. And so I would tell my early learner self to pay attention more because I'm certain that I missed quite a few um, wisdom keys and nuggets along the way. Okay. All right, I see that the numbers are going up and people are typing in the chat and I love that because this is a way that you get to know yourself and then we get to know a little bit more about you. And I know that um, Emily's gonna read some of these off, but for yeah. others, um, if you wanna go down and your greatest life lesson, if you would just pick one and kind of type those in. And I'm asking these questions because it's important that you become in tune with who you are. For two years, we've been disconnected from society. We have spent a lot of time with people in our homes and we were like the spirit of together is literally just too much right now. And so this gives you an opportunity to just reconnect with yourself as a learner, fall in love again with all of the things that made being a student or being an educator 
a great opportunity. So um, share away in the chat and Emily, take it away. Absolutely. Listen more. Um, I could probably <laughs> take that advice as well, too. I would tell my early learner self to trust my instincts more. Um, I'm just going to go down a little bit more. Okay. A um, couple more options in here. Ask for help. Find your purpose early. Discover the why. Early learner self, try not to be so hard on myself. And if you make a mistake, it's okay. They're actually learning opportunities. Love that. Anything else that you're seeing? I would tell my younger self to study abroad while I'm in college. Oh, very nice. Don't give up. You will fall or be pushed down. Get back up and press through. Your dreams will be yours. It's okay to be human. Mm, I like that. Absolutely. My Live. voice is important. Ooh, Ooh. Sorry. No, Step that was right good. On your voice. <laughs> that was good. That so we was all good. agree on that one, that your voice is important and it matters. Live and explore learning and travel. Wonderful. Well, I don't want to leave this slide too soon. When you think about your greatest life lesson, I know that there are probably so many, and everybody may not fill into these very categories, but as you're growing, as you're maturing as an individual, make certain that you're, you know, given those self, those lists that you need, you know, to ask myself, my greatest life lesson as a student, as an educator, as a parent, as a friend, as a neighbor, as a family member, as a community leader, these are all the spaces where we each find ourselves throughout the course of possibly even a single day. We wear so many hats. And so sometimes we're teaching informally, sometimes we're teaching formally. And so this gives us an opportunity to really notice the spaces that we occupy and how we make a difference in each of those spaces. Anything stick out before I move forward? Let me see. Yeah, I love um, one more thing I just wanna share. Get to know your life lessons as an educator. Get to know your students, understand the challenges, use the strengths to build confidence. Very nice, very nice. So one of the reasons for doing this exercise as I stated was getting us into that space of learning to love what we enjoy. Some of us are readers, some of us are walkers, some of us are talkers, some are runners, some like being indoors, outdoors, it depends. You could be an introvert or an extrovert, but we all find ourselves occupying the same time and space at any given moment. For the number of times that I have gone into Costco or Walmart and someone will ask me a question and then I may ask someone that I don't even know a question because I just feel like we're in Costco together. So clearly you have to know something that I don't know about what happens in this store. And it's just the little things sometimes that draw us to one another and give us that ability to have relation and connectivity. And with that being said, differences make the difference. How we see education, how we gather information, whether it's driven by ideology, experience versus knowledge, our teaching philosophies and how we approach not only the learning process, but how we give that information to other people, our ideas and our approaches all play a very big part in how we lead and guide others in navigating the space in the world in which they live. And sometimes our environmental influence has that type of an impact on us. And we often, I can say guilty as charged, have taken for granted environmental influence and its impact. Because one of the reasons I asked where everyone was from, we all are in different spaces in time in this moment. Even though we had a singular encounter for two years that we all went through together, we navigated it differently simply because of our environment and the impact that it had on us. Some people who live in food deserts had a greater disparity when it came to having food. Students who did not have access to technology who are in rural settings, we had to wait a while. And so students who had access to technology couldn't use it because we had to wait for other students to gain that access. And so when we think about our approaches to education and how people get information and how it is given to them, one of the things that still resonates with me is that even when raising my nieces, I could still tell that some of the 1970s and 1980s philosophies related to our approach to education still stood. It was not until literally this pandemic where we were like, 
Um, yeah, everybody can go to school online. Uh, why are you having a snow day and you have a computer? Because we're virtual. And so it's the little things that made me realize that we are still in that space where brick and mortar has been for the longest time the only way to have education. But as we can tell, our colleges and our universities have moved into that space where you can have online class, you can have outdoor class, you can have some version of a hybrid class. So it gives us the opportunity to see how technology has broadened our understanding of what can be. This pandemic forced us to see that the impossible is probable. And now we see that it was possible because here we are tonight living it. So if you have anything that you'd like to share related to that in the chat, please go ahead and do so because I know that others will be reading the chat and we're here tonight to learn from each other, to take this opportunity to really showcase that we all value not only education, but as someone said, our voice does matter. And so we want to learn, I want to learn from you. I know that I'll be reading the chat later and seeing some things that I had not even thought of before and how ideology and experience and knowledge and teaching philosophies and ideas and approaches and environmental influences and impact are shaping the way we perceive and again receive information and content. And I'll just step in there um, as Dr. Really? Jackie asked if anyone has any thoughts on that that they want to share. It's okay if the answer is no, we can come back to it, but I just wanted to pause just for a moment in case someone's trying to type. <clears throat> okay. Kate O'Leary. Yes, absolutely. Go ahead, Dr. Lynn. It makes me consider what also needs to change to break down the structure of school needs to be revised to make new experiences meaningful and current. And don't be afraid to use the hand raising function when Dr. Jackie asks if you have something you'd like to say, we'd be happy to call on you. Absolutely, and I love that um, statement that you just made. We literally are in that space where we are, some we're breaking down by choice and some are, we're being broke down because we don't have a choice. If we're going to move forward, we have to be in that space where we can readily identify where change needs to happen and then be that voice so change can stay consistent as it comes to educating. I would like to ask in the chat, um, how many educators are elementary, middle school, high school, community college, higher ed? Uh, where do you all fall in the spectrum of educators in this space tonight? We've got community college, elementary, community college, higher ed, elementary, preschool, higher ed, military college, secondary, post-secondary, mm -hmm. um, middle school. Very nice. Lots um, of K-12 too as well. Lots of K-12. That's really good. I was a preschool teacher. Um, I started my education career um, at the Y because I wanted to give back to the community. So I was pre-K through five um, there when I lived in Texas. I've been a community college dean, professor, and vice president of academic and student affairs. And so definitely can understand how, when we talk about collaboration and being open to collaborating, that is a very important space, especially for individuals who are in the community college space because you, you run between two worlds. You have students who are in high school trying to make sure that they can finish and then determining whether or not they are prepared. Will they go to a four-year institution? Will they go to a technical school? Will they go to a community college and then those who do the two plus two platform. I made it through community college and now I'm ready to head on to a four-year school or you know do some advanced training and education in a career set. This allows us to understand that we have to be open to collaborate in each of our areas where you live and in the space that you identify as an educator, that collaboration can look very differently. Um, experienced teachers and learners from various generations have much to offer as mentors to novice teachers and learners. And I will tell you that statistics have shown that it is very difficult to be a new teacher in elementary school or in middle school. The dropout rate 
is right at about five years. And I'm hoping that between older teachers and younger teachers, that there's some synergy, that there is this level of respect between the younger teacher bringing in new ways of teaching and understanding how things are working with this generation of student, but also that cross respect that has to happen between older teachers and saying to the younger teacher saying, hey, I value what you brought to education and how can you help me with my classroom management? How do I speak to the parents? How do I relate to the community? And so this construct of being able to, you know, have a 25 year old teacher and a 65 year old teacher working in the same space, there's value there. Also, simultaneously, the new generation doesn't necessarily accept and respect established school and learning culture. I know that it was hard for some of my peers who were very accustomed to working in environments where the kids could you know, go outside and my friends who did Montessori for such a long time. And then all of a sudden they were in this space where there was structure and there were rules and it was just as hard for them as it was for the students. And so it's being able to say that I value this but I need a little bit of this other thing over here to make it work for me. So when you think about how we build schools today, how we manage our classrooms, how we let kids be kids and young adults be young adults can look different from you know California to where I am over here in Virginia, from East Coast to the West Coast, you know, from all the way up in North Dakota, all the way down to Texas, how we approach education can look different. But then specifically, the problem sometimes is how cross-generational differences concerning attitudes and perspectives can get in the way. Oh, there are too many young people coming in. They just let these kids run around all willy-nilly. I've heard it all. Oh, these other teachers who've been here, they you know, are too strict. They never give these kids room to breathe. And so how do you establish a sense of community and respect in the varied learning environments? And so the rest of our presentation tonight, we'll look at the generations how the generations learn, how they're <laughs> literally trying to embrace technology, how we may be pushing too fast, too soon. But for those who are early adopters, early adopters mean you got your first computer when Apple came out with the computer, that big clunky square, and then it moved to the one that had the colors. We were using those very hard three quarter disks, then we moved to floppy disks. I'm an early adopter. I learned DOS, okay? So I'm dating myself as well, but I like the fact that I know how things work. And that's the value that people who are even older than me who were at the front lines of education bring value to my life. They help me understand, well, what was your thought behind that when this was created? Why did your generation think that this was necessary? How did this become a mainstay? And so it's the types of questions that we ask that help to build community. But then for students who were born with technology literally running through their veins, they just seem to come forth knowing how to utilize a laptop and to get on the internet. And they, they understand how it works. And I like going to some of the younger generation and saying, uh, what does this button do? And it's been on my phone for a long time. How long has it been doing that? And so it's the little things sometimes that really cause me to pause and say, we're all here and we all have to work together. Um, any questions or comments that are coming through that are um, lending value to our dialogue tonight? I just, I have to say so many people were like, oh, I remember DOS and... <laughs> And there was just some funny banter with that, but nothing, nice. nothing else for right now. <laughs> no, I think that it's wonderful because we've all been doing this for a long time. And here's how we've been able to adapt. And so this is very interesting to me. And I've always loved this, that when you think about the generations that are alive today, starting with the traditionalists all the way to Gen Z, we are here. This is, and I want to say maybe it was 10 years ago that it was documented that the generations that are alive now have been the longest time that these generations together have been alive. That the mere fact that kids today know their great grandparent is astonishing. And so we're in that space where we're all occupying time together. So starting with the traditionalists, anybody born before 1946, the baby boomer between 1946 and 1964, the Gen X born between 1965 and 1980, the millennial or Gen Y between 1980 and 1997, and then the current generation Gen Z born after 1997. And I'm sure before we get to the end of this year, there will be another name 
name added to this list because we are growing rapidly and we are here on this earth making change and making strides. And so I wanted you to see this generational learners category as I talk through the next several slides. And then we'll look a little bit closer at how we are adapting ourselves to the use of technology and what this means in education. Because the more that you learn about these generational learners, it gives you an opportunity to say in your workspace, oh my God, I understand this person so much better now. This makes so much sense why so-and-so does this or why so many people are retiring. Because there's just some things that other people are not going to embrace. And so being okay with that and being able to work together, rather than being frustrated, this will give us an opportunity to see the learner in that light. So here's how we bridge the gap. So around 50,000 educators back in 2010 got together and tried to figure out in this survey, what was the best way and time period for us to begin to forge change? And I think that it's important that we see now here in 2022 that we may be at this space again, where we are looking at how schools are run. We're looking at what technologies are in the school. We're looking at how, okay, I won't even use the T word, but textbooks. Do textbooks even still exist? And I'm asking because <laughs> there's so much digital-based knowledge now that I'm not certain if our students have the capacity to really like hold a textbook, to feel the pages. So short of going to the library, this may be an opportunity where students don't have a chance to really identify and understand how we're going to move them through this educational cycle from preschool to high school and then on into college. But in this pandemic-based environment, we do see that learners were challenged by accessibility. I said earlier that people that were in rural America did not have technology. So some of our phone companies, a lot of these fiber optic lines were run. People were taking buses and converting them. And those here in Virginia, in the mountains, if the kids there did not have access to internet, then the kids down the mountain didn't have an opportunity to go to class. So what they decided to do during the pandemic was they would load buses with Wi-Fi. They would drive the buses up so far until the farthest home could have access. And this went on for two years. And so this allowed education to take place. I have to tell you, it was a struggle for a lot of the young kids, you know, and even the parents. We started out with the Edmentum, then we moved to Schoology, then somebody figured out how Google Meet could work to have classes. And then all of a sudden we were like, praise the Lord, these kids can go back to the classroom now. At least if it's just for one or two days a week. But but parents, my goodness, for those of you who are parents, you learn quickly how to put your degree to use so that you can become an educator of all the subjects that your students were taking. And so this gives us an opportunity to really figure out how does digital equity play a part in an individual's opportunity to learn, to have access to critical information that is a key component to their stages of growth and stages of development. We all know as educators that from birth, to one to two years old, those are the foundational levels where our kids are receiving so much knowledge and it's just being poured at them, but it's not until three to five and then seven to eight that they're really able to reciprocate that and give it back, that things that we poured in, we're now seeing coming out through identification and the ability to murmur words and then being able to talk and getting out to be able to act. And it's that student that falls in the category who gets stuck at age 13 and up. This pandemic literally hindered a lot of kids from being able to have social emotional engagement and that in itself, you know, we're still working as educators to really discover how do we reach these children. They may not have come out of the womb as an introvert, but somewhere during that pandemic, they lost that ability to want to socialize with other people. There was no level of enrichment and engagement. And so teachers in the classroom are struggling with how to touch that kid. You know, what is the touch point that is needed to move that child along? So if you have any ideas in the chat about things that your school is doing or that you are doing as an educator and a leader to move kids along, especially the young kids too, Kids who missed kindergarten, who went to school for the first time in second grade, 
that has to be tough. And the kids who missed out, um, you know, the last two years of middle school, and then all of a sudden they're thrust into high school. Kids who graduated high school in a pandemic and didn't get to go to college until they were sophomores. There was so much engagement and enrichment that comes from being able to be together. And so it's up to us as adults to discover how to bridge the gap for these kids so that their learning experiences are brighter and are more fulfilled. And I would just take a quick pause. If anyone Surely. does want to um, raise their hand, we can always unmute you. Someone did mention um, in the chat, learning to socialize was the greatest gap they observed. But if you have any strategies that your school is currently using that you want to share, feel free to let us know. I would love to hear that information and even parents. You know, what have you been doing to aid your child and feeling comfortable with being out in the world when for two years they were not able to do so? Things were foreign. Oh, I do have someone who would like to speak. So I'm going to ask Yorel to unmute. Hi, good evening. Hello. Good evening. Um, I was the one who, who noted in terms of the socializing and I teach eighth grade. And um, last year we were pushing, the teachers were pushing into each classroom, which meant that the students stayed in the classroom. And I believe that between um, being home for a while and then coming in, wearing a mask, having to stay in the same seat, uh, taking, I don't know how many classes in one area, including their lunch and not moving affected um, how they could even get to know each other. And I feel that that's part of the learning gap that if they uh, do not have that peer support, there's only so much the teachers can also do because it's a community uh, learning environment. And this year I see them gravitating to their phones. So it has taken a concerted effort to uh, create activities that would interest them, that would make them put their phones down to interact. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. I almost want to take a moment of silence there. <laughs> you know, it, because it is hard when you think about what we were doing in eighth grade and how much fun we were having running outside and, you know, playing tag with our friends and going to track meets or band competitions or gymnastics meets or, you know, just sitting, you know, out in the yard, just having fun and being kids and kids were robbed of some of that. And so as we are growing and understanding, you know, I challenge parents and teachers, you know, to share a little bit more of yourself with your students, let them know that it wasn't always like that. And hopefully as we move forward, it won't always be this way so that they can see that there is a glimmer of hope in exploration because exploration does allow for a child to blossom and to find ways and pique their curiosity and you know just have that sense of wonderment that childhood gave us. And so as we talk about understanding the five generations, um, before I move forward, was there anything else, Emily? Yes, Dr. Jackie, hey. if I could share um, just a strategy that Portia put in the um, chat. Yes. We started off incorporating social emotional learning slash character education. Mm -hmm. Most teachers are intentionally using turn and talks and group discussions within their lessons to try to help encourage this social engagement. Very nice. It reminds me of what we used to call, I'm literally dating myself. Um, I won't say by show of hands, but um, who all participated in show and tell <laughs> growing up? Absolutely. And, and I think that that's a great way to um, turn something that was into something that works now. Turn and talk is an excellent way to tell kids that you may be a little shy, but you're in a safe space you're in a brave space. And so take the courage and opportunity to turn and talk to other people. And so this gives us that opportunity to do so. Anyone and then else? just think pair share is another strategy that um, oh, two teachers sure. have been using to help encourage that. Very nice. I think um, I'm in that 
generation that was born in 1965. And so I find myself being still very youthful, but also being in that space of coach mentor, <laughs> you know, I was like, I want to do that. This looks like so much fun. It's so cool. But then at the same time, I can bring some of what my childhood was like to these various spaces in this cross-generational society in which we live in. And some of the unique characteristics, as you can see, we all have different attitudes about our work. Students should come in the classroom. They should sit down. They could get their pencils. They should put their noses in their books or in their Chromebooks now and, you know, just really stick with it. But then there's expectations also related to the level of engagement. Do we engage student to student, peer to peer? Do they have engagement with us in the college environment? Do they have engagement with their fellow students in their cohorts? What does this look like, this word engagement? And how far can we take it and push the envelope to move people out of this pseudo comfort zone, because I don't believe it's a comfort zone that will continue. It's just one that we happen to be in at the moment. And then the communication can vary. As someone stated, kids are in their cell phones and we're, you know, doing dances to TikTok. We are on Twitter, Instagram. We are on Facebook. We're on tons and tons of ways in which we're communicating, but we're not communicating with each other. We don't have that ability to high five and hug and, you know, add a girl, add a boy, you know, all of those things that we've been so accustomed to doing in our society when we talk about getting together and having friendship and fellowship and opportunity. So how we communicate is even different. You know, people communicate now with an emoji. An emoji can say a whole paragraph, you know, <laughs> you know, depending on the context in which it was sent, an, an emoji can speak volumes. And so it's the ways in which we now begin to verify and understand how language translates from generation to generation in this digital age and having some level of digital, digital agility, getting on, you know, this tonight may not have been easy for people in different platforms and different groups because we all deal with technology different like oh my god another zoom what is a bitly you know why do i see a thousand tiny urls why can't i just get the website because what would people were accustomed to it doesn't look like what it used to even though it's designed to make getting around technology easier um work hours what are those <laughs> How, who has work hours the ones that you made or does your company still have work hours or you're just kind of getting in that time as you get it in because we're so unstructured now in that regard and so we're figuring it out people want more balance in their lives and they're taking advantage of being able to have that balance for someone said that um, they were working in a military space and i know that there's still structure there so work hours dress code code of conduct those things still matter Kids in my county, they're at this space now where the teacher's like, please just show up because they were home for so long that every day is pajama day. And I mean that literally, if I see one more kid, you know, in the grocery store with pajama bottoms on as pants, it's like mind blowing to me. But I understand that the key thing right now is they feel comfortable getting out. They're actually going to class and they're having some socialization. So I can fight the other battle <laughs> on another day at a different time, but I'm glad to see that adults and kids are finding their space in the times in which we're currently living. Questions, comments, or observations? And I just wanna do a friendly time check, just so you know, we have about 20 minutes left in the hour. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> Doctor. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, Dr. Martin, I was just going to say that I think uh, from your previous slide, I think the, the, the thing that we're facing in education more than anything is, is that the engagement, and then I think you put the code of conduct because of the social issues. So those two factors to me, yes, yeah, stand out the most is because mm -hmm. we're wanting to re-engage students because now they're all physically back but they don't know how to be back. So, <laughs> so we're struggling with trying to, and then, so that means educators everywhere, clearly in the world, because of the great resignation we're seeing all around the world, are struggling with that same fact that they'd rather leave than stay. And so then for administration, I just think that's what we're all trying to face and curtail any way we can before the next school year starts. 
Absolutely. And it will it will look differently um, for those kids who've never been to school before. This is what they know for kids who had been, you know, in school, similar to the kids in Katrina in Jefferson Parish in Louisiana. They're the kids who were hybrid. It was like, OK, we know what school was like before Katrina. We know what school is like after Katrina. And then there was a kids in the middle. It's like, why do you guys do that? We've never seen that before. And so all of these different dynamics. So as we talk about generations at a glance, and, and this is where we'll start to um, wrap things up, I just wanted you to see this slide and how the different generations over time have impacted what education looks like and how we receive information. And our names have changed. You know, there's the veterans generation, you know, in one season of time, and then there were the matures in another season of time, and then the silent generation and the various generations. So we've had tons of names. And oftentimes who raised us also plays a part in how we navigate the world in which we were living in. For those of you who were raised by a parent or an aunt or an uncle who were pretty close to your age and or maybe just 12 or 15 years older than you, they were a lot more loose and happening and having a good time. But you know, for some who were raised by a grandparent or a great grandparent, things were a little bit more structured and they were a little more strict. So knowing how to relax a little is not always easy. And so this gives us an opportunity to see that as we are growing and as we're maturing as a country, that education has followed suit with the generations. And each of those generations brings a little bit of what they have learned to that space. I will tell you, as I move to the next slide, the veteran generation, you know, would be these individuals that are traditionalists, born before 1946. And the way we do some things now, they would consider it wasteful. And so I'm always mindful that when I'm talking to someone who is my mother's age or my grandmother's age, it's like, okay, I know that if I put something on my plate, I need to eat it. There's no running to the cafeteria, getting this, getting that, taking a sip and throwing the whole thing away. That's just not going to work. But as it relates to education and learning, as you can see here, that these learners are in their late 70s, they're older, they like structure, things have to be with some sense of control. They prefer a lecture learning style. They enjoy sitting down, pen and pad, and having someone talk to them because that's how they learn. The person in the front of the room is the expert. And so they may not be as comfortable with technology, but they're definitely capable of it because everybody has a cell phone. And these individuals are mentors, coaches, and sponsors. And so they're mentoring other people, they're coaching others in their midway of life, and then they're sponsoring other people to move up to the next level. The traditionalist comes after them, the baby boomer. Uh, yeah, 1946 to 1964, they're in their late 50s to mid 70s and they thrive. They like traditional learning, but they're capable of learning online. They do like things that are self-paced because this is a generation that, look, I will walk away from it is what this generation said. And we were seeing that someone just said it, the great resignation, and it is happening now. It's like, I'm not waiting until I'm 65 or whatever to retire. I can take my time and my resources now, and I can just move on from all of this. They like feedback and reflection. So if you're working with someone that you never give them kudos or applause, or someone doesn't feel like they're being heard, then this is the person who's sulking you know, in the staff meeting because no one and recognize the great job they did, you know, on the bulletin board that was in the hallway. And so we have to be mindful of how people like to be appreciated. They embrace various levels and uses of technology, and they also serve as mentors, coaches, and sponsors. And some of you may also find yourself in this space. You know, one of these people may be you, and you're saying, I see myself right now. And this explains so much of why we do pushback. Because in pushback comes the ability to say, um, this is not for me. It's not how I want to receive information. It's not how I learn. Now, one of the disadvantages of that is that when we get into talking to these younger generations, we have a tendency to teach or tell or show information, whether it's professional development or academic learning, the way that we receive it. So as teachers, we have to be all things to all learners. And so sometimes it gets difficult being able to do that. So this generation X, 40s to mid 50s, me born in 1965, I'm very independent. I know a lot of people in my peer group who are also independent. I wanna go out and get my own information. I want to figure out how it resonates and works for me. And then if I need help, I'll give you a call. Otherwise, 
I'm good. And so we thrive in that space of being able to make our own schedules, to do what we know we need to do. We're that generation on applications when they started saying um, job requires self-starter. <laughs> I think that they wrote that line in those applications and job descriptions for people like us. It's like um, needs self-starter, has to be able to work alone in an environment, but can communicate fairly well with other people when required to do so. And these individuals also serve as mentors, coaches, and sponsors. We're at that age. If you're in this age group and you don't think that you can mentor someone, you have enough knowledge to be able to do so. Take a young teacher, you know, by the side, take an older teacher by the hand, you know, navigate this space for them and be a coach to other people. Help them see that what they're doing is good, but there's always more that they can do. And then sponsor someone toward leadership or going to the next level, giving them an opportunity to showcase and shine in their respective environment and space. After Generation X is the millennial. I love this age group because they're just at that space of maturity where they are good listeners mid-20s to early 40s. They're very self-directed. They desire personalized training. I hear that a lot from millennials. Okay, so what am I going to get out of it? And can this be customized to this? Because this, 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 and this, and I prefer. And I like the ability that they identify that their voice in this space, as tech savvy as they are, can really articulate their needs. And so they enjoy relaxed working environments. You know, companies and schools have open learning spaces that are very good for this group of student. They thrive on personal relationships. They have a core group of people that can often lead to group think, but that allows them to feel validated in that space. And then they seek engagement of a mentor or a coach. And so this is that age group that is saying, we want to add value to the world, please show us how, give us an opportunity and we won't disappoint you. And then there's Gen Z, born after 1997. Their learners are in their late teens and mid twenties and they are multitasking people. They are digital native and very tech savvy, very interactive and social and they are skeptical of mentors, coaches and sponsors to a degree in the sense of the, what if I disappoint them? What if I'm not good enough? Because again, that personal validation is extremely important. So your approach to this kind of learner needs to be one that is what I call a praise sandwich. You're doing a great job. I can see you putting in your effort. I want you to consider A, B, C, and D. And then let's revisit that as you're taking on these new skills. So it's how we also communicate and give feedback. The feedback loop in education is a very big proponent for students being able to stick with education. I would hate to see with all that we've invested in trying to get our country on track in this pandemic, that students would begin to drop out because teachers don't or won't take the time to invest and engage in this level of learner because they will surprise us as they get to be our age, they will give back what we pour in. So let's make certain that we are doing some high levels of pouring. How are we doing? Anything, Emily? As we, we're rounding out the last few slides now. We're doing, we're doing great. We just have people popping in the chat um, what generation they are, they uh, awesome. affiliate with. Okay, wonderful. So as you are seeing um, your peers in the chat and this collaboration with the generations is definitely viable and important. And we've seen and are seeing this paradigm shift taking place. In order to reach people, there has to be a level of mutual acceptance. I identify that people that I work with come from different generations. And so it was important to me to learn how they want to be approached and how they receive information. Teaching, there has to be a mutual appreciation for teaching. Teaching is a very big part of what we do, whether it's professional development, whether it's a class that you're taking, and then how other people receive what you're giving to them. Teaching is key to all success. And then leading, it has to be mutually beneficial, not necessarily in the quid pro quo realm, but leading. I, I want to push you just a little bit more. I want to guide you out of that space where you may not be comfortable. So the mutual benefit is I get you out of your comfort zone and have someone else who can work at a capacity that they're capable and then I can turn things over now to you because I see your growth and then move on myself to other
other things so that I can grow as well. And so mutual acceptance, mutual appreciation, and mutual benefit are ways collaboration can work among the generations. So some of our takeaways tonight. The educational leader and administrative engagement, administrative leadership should definitely examine the opportunities to build relationships between the different generations. If you serve in administrative capacity, this is a space where you will see the, the need for more substantive dialogue. Educational leaders cannot assume all learners are of one mindset. This pandemic has shown us that people are coming from all different directions trying to navigate education. So let's give all of us grace in order to be able to do that well together. And then instructional teams of different generations do hold different perceptions and growth excuse me, and growth comes from shared experiences. So if you work on a design team, if you are a curriculum writer, it's okay to have different kinds of examples for those of you who are do database questions, it's okay, you know, to have different levels of questions from different generations that will resonate. Some kids will remember, you know, what it was like to use Amazon to buy school supplies. And other kids will remember what it meant to pack up in the car to physically go and look at a notebook. And so we want to make certain that we are teaching our children also how to relate to one another because during this pandemic, they've all had different experiences and encounters. And this gives us the flexibility to build what is needed in order to help them see themselves in the world as they grow. And then a couple of truths, generations must find ways to work together despite their differences, organizational leaders and mixed generational leaders and learning environments. We will all find it challenging, but it'll still be rewarding. Educational leaders must acknowledge you know, demographic challenges and then strive to keep communication in the forefront. And then finally, educational leaders and advocates, you know, we have the inherent responsibility to balance what this looks like for all generations and in that learning environment, find places for people to not only strive, but to thrive. And then last but not least, the learner rich environment. This is gonna be hard because we've already seen how it's impacting us, but personally, and professionally, let some of your reflections fall in these ways. And if you have other reflections, by all means, please type them in the chat. Effective and supportive learning atmosphere. Some of the questions you should ask, how are learners impacted through collaboration? Effective and supportive working environment. What was learned during the or your personal phases of acclimation to collaboration? Collaboration doesn't come easy. We're, Everybody can't play in the same sandbox and you know who those people are. So I'm gonna leave it at that. And then communication and effectiveness. How prepared are learners from level to level? That's from life levels to grade level to school situations and classes. And then how is communication expanded through collaborative efforts? So take a screenshot of this if you would like. Um, make certain that you are able to respond to these in your personal time as you reflect on the time that we've had here tonight so that we give ourselves the capacity to continue to grow beyond this webinar. Questions? Absolutely. We'll open it up to some questions. We do have some time for that. <clears throat> and while I wait for anyone to raise their hand or pop mm -hmm. anything in the chat, I did want to share um, Dr. Susan Thompson posted in the chat that she really likes the idea it's a collaborative effort that's being emphasized rather than a one-size-fits-all approach. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, and then we have a request about going back a slide, I believe. Are you trying to grab? We're going back. Okay, how far back would you like for me to go? Katrina, two slides back. Oh, so you can take a, a screenshot of the questions? Or something else. Yes, the last slide, yeah, I believe. Yeah, so yeah, the question. Thank so you. So they can get a screenshot of it. Absolutely. There you go. Um, and I, I love that idea about um, the collaboration piece. So um, I do want to say something that Kate has posted as well, too, while we see if anyone has any questions. Um, Kate posted in the chat, I think these takeaways are also applicable to instructional design for students. We must build relationships between teacher student and student student and provide choices for students to navigate their learning. 
And um, we do actually have another webinar coming up on March 10th through VESC and CTL on empathy map mapping with two with some um, instructional design members as well too. So check that out. Um, I think maybe J Dr. Jackie, if you have some thoughts about this, how feedback, how feedback plays a role in collaboration. We must be willing to share feedback, what works and what doesn't. What are some ideas that you have on, on that as well too, right? With collaboration. Uh, feedback is important. Just as the student wants to hear they've done a good job or they would like you to look at their draft before they submit their final copy, that feedback builds assurances, but it also builds confidence. And from that teacher perspective or that peer-to-peer -peer work group environment, collaboration related to feedback gives individuals the opportunity to know that we're all moving together. It's not going to be faculty against administration. It's not gonna be students against teachers. It's all of us working together for the collective. And so when I think about feedback, I like feedback, I like to give feedback. And I try to explain to people that not all the feedback will be positive, but it will be constructive in a sense that we can see the big picture together. So when it comes to feedback, I would say first, begin with where you're trying to go. So that way when feedback is given, you know that you all started in the same direction trying to move to a space. Or, or is it that time where we're just gonna throw it all to the wall and everybody say something and no one be critical and we just hear each other out. I think that's also a really great space and to have feedback in collaboration. That first we wanna just put all of our ideas out there so that the group can agree upon what we need to do because we've all seen it and heard it and no one feels victimized that I didn't get my voice out. I didn't share my opinion. Someone shot me down. And so this is the reason why I don't like silos. I think it's important that people work together in groups and teams so that way we can all know that everyone is involved because we're all dealing with the same kids. At the end of the day, my preschool kid is going to end up in somebody's college classroom. Did I do the best job possible? Did I talk to people across platforms to make certain that that kid had what they needed? And so I think that that feedback between grades, that feedback between um, clusters, um, between high school and community college and college and four-year institution and middle school, high school, all of them, collaboration has to exist so that way we all know that we're guiding our students toward the best possible life experience it's possible. Thank you so much, Dr. Jackie. And we have um, so many people that have said thank you so much. And if you don't mind, one last slide going to um, your contact information um, oh, sure. before we close, if that's all right, oh. that would be great. Oh, yeah. So the website is jhoodandassociates.org. Um, but there's a contact page there. Okay. <laughs> so that you got, I was trying to figure out, do I have an email? And there's an email there too, but it's Jackie, J-A-C-Q-U-I-E at J-A-C-Q-U-I-E-H-O-O-D.com. Jackie at JackieHood.com. Um, and just put VESC in the RE, and that way I'll know what it is from, um, and that's perfectly okay. Or you can use the form that's on jhoodandassociates.org, our nonprofit, and that way it gives you the opportunity to type in um, any follow-up information that you may want or need from me. Absolutely, and sure. as, as a reminder, um, this webinar is being recorded, and we will post it in our CTL uh, webinar LibGuides page for future reference, and then I do have to do Two more, two more tiny shameless plugs before we close. Um, Dr. Jackie is coming back to present with us in a, a separate webinar for emotional resilience in March. And we're so excited to have her come back. We're just thrilled to be able to give our alum, alumna uh, a platform to come and present and share, share their knowledge because knowledge is power. So thank you for the opportunity. It was wonderful. I had such a good time with everyone. Absolutely. Well, participating as well. Thank you so much. And Dr. Amy Lynn, thank you so much for the opportunity to work with VESC as always. Until the next time, everyone, thank you for coming and we will see you in the next time. Thank you, Dr. Hood Martin. Thank you. Bye now.